Uh, welcome to the West London Sport QPR podcast on the back of a much needed Rangers victory against Watford on Saturday. Victories at home have been as rare as rocking horse manure this season, but Gareth Ainsworth's first as QPR manager into the run of nine without a win at Loftus Road, dating back to mid October and the first three points since beating Preston at Deepdale the week before Christmas. Uh, Ainsworth's side make the long trip to Blackpool on Tuesday. In another example of EFL decision makers taking fans into consideration when they draw up their season schedules. Um, Blackpool deservedly won 1 0 when the sides last met back in August, but like Rangers, they find themselves at the wrong end of the table and six points away from safety with just one league win since October. However, in their last match at home, Mick McCarthy's men held free scoring runaway leaders Burnley to a 0 0 draw, so it won't be an easy game for Rangers at all. Uh, as always, I'm joined by ex QBR striker and captain Kevin Gallon. And it's just like the old days today. We welcome back Dan Bennett, now of Haters Sports News Agency, following his Mick. No, call me Michael. Now my eyes <laughs> deal like departure from West London Sport for a set of tracksuits and a bag of balls. Dan, of course, is our resident Blackpool fan and here to fill us in on the Rangers opponents tomorrow. Sorry, uh, Ian, Kevin, can you call me Dan? Can you call me Daniel now, please? Call you Daniel. <laughs> um, I'm joking. <laughs> but, uh, but Kevin, you were there on Saturday, uh, unlike myself, who was covering the Leicester Chelsea game. Uh, a fine rick victory, and by the sounds of it, you know, a great game. Yeah, deserved, deserved win. Good crowd, good atmosphere. Um, yeah, I think the tempo of the of the of QPR performance was a lot better than what I've seen lately. Uh, went listen to us again at the the West London pod to, to get the free at the back. Uh, they've listened to us again, Ian, and and it suited and it suited us. Rob Dickey looked the different player as well. Coming out with a ball, that extra man, that extra cover, uh, suit QPR. And we sort of just, you know, work rate was good and we put the ball in behind and we chased it and we won tackles and Tim scored a really good goal and that sort of set us up for a deserved victory. And with, with the three at the back, I mean, Sam Phil played on, on on the left of the three. I mean, he's a big loss in the middle of the park, but I mean, it seems like obviously that a clean sheet and a win, it made a big difference having him there. Yeah, definitely. We we spoke about it last week. Well, I did. I said the main the main um, part of football, QPR against Watford was to keep a clean sheet, and uh, because we hadn't for a while. I mean, was it four games before that? Three goals in each game, something really sort of poor stat. But yes, field came in, looked solid. They just looked a lot, just looked a lot better, just a lot more solid. Didn't really give um, no space for the Watford players, strikers um, to get into and. Yeah, we, I, I think that will be the case for the. I'd say to the, for the rest of the season, if, if um, people are, um, if like field just has to go back into that um, position, Johansson might have to step into the midfield again. But it worked out a treat and thoroughly deserved three points. And the wing backs, I mean, they wouldn't be your first choice wing backs. Aaron True and Ozzy Kakai playing on the on the left. I mean, how did they do? They done well. Very good performances. That's probably the best I've seen Kakai play for QPR. He he actually had a couple of shots. So he came in on his right, his favoured right foot from the left, and it was. I think it suited the uh, Drew and Kakai being further up the pitch and more attacking than um, than defending. So no, they're not, they're not, they ain't the, the the first choice. But you know they'll be playing. I assume they'll be playing tomorrow against uh, Blackpool because one they played well, and two don't like change a winning team. And now get a bit of confidence and get playing and get, and get some more wins under our belts. And obviously, Lyndon Dykes back as well. He, again, we have said him before numerous times, he's probably the most discussed player on this podcast. But in what, what he doesn't often deliver in goals, he, he, you know, but the team do a bit better with him him in the side. Yeah, definitely. He won headers, he, he battled, he caused them, um, it was a handful for the defenders and, and Chris Martin as well. You know, the ball went up, it stuck, or they flicked it on and they chased it down, and then it caused a lot of um, hassle for the centre halves, and and it's been missing. You know that. Uh, you know we were a little bit more direct. I'd seen Senny Dieng wasn't rolling the ball out as often as he usually does. There was more kicking it longer, and we were winning that first ball and keeping the ball in their half. And Lina Dykes, you know, he's done well considering is that that illness he's had, and we didn't know when he was coming back. So he, he, he played a good part and hopefully he'll be getting stronger for the rest of the season. OK, Dan. Now, Blackpool, as I mentioned before, won this the fixture 1-0 back in 
mm. back in August. But it, it's been a tough season, really, for them. And, I mean, losing Neil Critchley at the start of the season, who, you know, was so important to what they had achieved before that. Um, the pole opposite to what he did at QPR. But, um, I mean, what what's happened down there? Yeah, just a bit. I mean... I, like I say, it's funny how QPR and Blackpool seasons have sort of become linked in this strange way because because of Neil Critchley. I mean, in very different ways. Obviously, QPR sacking Critchley was something that probably had to happen, whereas Blackpool losing Neil Critchley in the summer has basically put us into the situation that we're in now, I think. Um, I mean, something had to change. Obviously, we had Michael Appleton in charge before Mick McCarthy is in charge now. And I think we were heading for, for League One under Appleton. I'm not, you know, it was a, a terrible appointment. And I would say in hindsight, but I think people knew at the time because, you know, the fans didn't want him because he managed just about 10 years ago and stayed, stuck around for about two months and then went to uh, to Blackburn where I think he lasted about the same and, and got sacked. So the fans didn't want him. Um, and it's, it started out, you know, OK under him, but it quickly went down and, you know, they've obviously decided to get Mick McCarthy in, who's one of those stereotypical rescue job managers, isn't he, like Huddersfield have done with Neil Warnock to try and turn things around. But unfortunately, it's just not had the desired effect. I think, Ian, you touched on it. The only kind of one slight glimmer of hope that Blackpool fans still have is the home form has actually been OK under McCarthy, but the away form is, I mean, terrible. I think we've lost every away game under McCarthy and we lost 2-0 at Bristol City on Saturday. So... You know, it's we're, we're quite hard to beat at home. That's the only kind of, like I said, slight glimmer of hope that Blackpool fans still have. But unfortunately, I think we all know it's heading one way at the moment, and that's that's League One. Okay, well, I mean, this this fixture last year was a one all draw, but I mean, Blackpool were the better side for most of it, and you know, there's a real raucous atmosphere up there. Is that still the case for home mm. games where it's, you know, it's a, a small compact ground, but the, the fans really get behind the team. Has that been the case this season, despite the results not being as good? Yeah, I think that helps. Like obviously, when the results aren't as good, there's always going to be that knock-on effect on the atmosphere, isn't it? Where it's probably not quite as good as it was last season when we did it pretty well, finished 16th, stayed up very comfortably. So it's probably not quite as what it was, but certainly, even when we've been losing, the atmosphere has still been very good. And I think that's a massive thing, you know, reason for behind our home form as well. Is you know, I think it's three draws and a win. Off the top of my head under McCarthy, which isn't you know amazing, but it's a lot better than our away form, that's for sure. So I think that does help the home form having that backing from the fans as well. But yeah, it'll be an interesting one tomorrow. I mean, when we were talking in October last year, when I was still doing the pod, you know, I didn't think that I'd be coming on and talking about QPR Blackpool being a bit of a relegation six pointer. But here we are, you know. What I would say is, I think QPR beating Watford on Saturday is a massive result. I mean, you're not by any means safe yet. But I think, what is the gap, like 10 points, I think? Yeah, 10 points. Um, 10 points, yeah. So, with what, eight, is it eight games left, I think, now? 10, ten points in eight games. I th- I, you know, 10, I yeah. Mean, I, I, that, I mean, that, be all right. that win on Saturday is, is so crucial for QPR. But not massive. only for the points, massive, but for the crowd and the atmosphere and the confidence going going on for the rest of the season. That, that was a much-needed win. And... You know, it would have to be a, a, an absolute a disastrous turn. Yeah, of exactly. Order to, to, you know, Blackpool to turn that ten points. Sorry, Dan, but <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're Black, right. Yeah, you get a win like QPR did on Saturday. Hopefully not tomorrow, but um, you get a win and it, everything changes. The atmosphere and you're looking, you're looking forward. So, yeah, a bit interesting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you think if Blackpool beat QPR tomorrow, then it you know, you, you start to worry again because obviously we'd be gaining points on QPR. So I think it's important just not to lose the game tomorrow for QPR. You know, yeah. if you go, if you beat Watford and then you go and lose at Blackpool, it's sort of like you're taking a step back again and the pressure's back on. So I think it's a massive game, really. I think, you know, if QPR could get a draw there, I think given the situation, you know, it's just about saying up really this season and then looking towards the summer, isn't it? And It'll be interesting to see what happens with Cooper on the summer because there's going to be a lot of change, I think, and it's going to be obviously difficult to do that with the financial situation. So, yeah, it's just about getting, just you know, getting towards that. It was normally about 50 points, isn't it? Just over 50 points, I think, was the absolutely guarantee safety. I mean, you probably won't even need that looking at the league table this season. So, it's just about getting a couple more, a few more points on the board, I think, for QPR, and hopefully they can, uh, hopefully they can do that. Obviously, I want QPR and Blackpool to stay up, so it would be nice if that could happen. I think QPR are a lot more likely, though. <laughs> OK, 
Okay. Kev, it feels like a big sort of next three games for QPR. It's obviously Blackpool and then it's Birmingham at home and then Wigan away. On paper, you think they all, they're all they all teams in the kind of in and around where QPR are at the bottom of the table. It's a real chance for, you know, Gareth to kind of, you know, consider that feel-good factor from from Saturday. But, I mean, or is there a danger? I mean, I mean, when Ian Holloway returned last time, the second time. And it beat Norwich in his first game, and it was a similar atmosphere, and everyone was buzzing, and they lost the next six. I mean, without putting a damper on it, I mean, now it's. Do you see? Do you see flickering signs of life that things? I mean, obviously players are going to come back soon, but do you see flickering signs of life that the, the team is heading in the right direction from what happened on Saturday? Well, yeah, because I mean, we had to break that that, that rot. You know, you can't one win in twenty and. You, you know, you're looking over your shoulders and the result against Rotherham last week was was poor. And, and that sort of three points and, you know, it gives the, the whole place the buzz. They'll be going into training today or yesterday for warm down, all buzzing because they've won a game. And um, and they'll be going into this game against Blackpool thinking, well, don't lose this game. Blackpool can't get three points on us and get back to seven and then you're sort of half looking over your shoulders because the next three games are all... All like relegation battles, really, but they're all for me winnable games to get points on the board for QPR. I think if we can nick maybe five points out of the next three games, that would be a good return. Mm. Take I take a draw tomorrow at Blackpool because you know we don't want Blackpool there behind us gaining three points. Us, you don't lose that game, and you sort of you go into the Birmingham game, and you're thinking, well, you can win this as, as well. So. I would take I'll take a point tomorrow night. I think that'd be a great result. Yeah, I think if yeah. you go there with the mindset of just not losing the game, I think you could get a draw because I mean we are crap. Like we're we're not good, <laughs> especially attacking going forward, and we we cannot score goals. You know we don't create chances, and then when we do get the odd chance, we miss it. So you know I think you look at the home games and it's they're all pretty and low point. scoring. <laughs> guaranteed yes. is a guarantee three points Dan <laughs> yeah I mean we'll make our predictions at the end but yeah, well know. I was a change mine for a draw now to <laughs> yeah. I've got to be honest but yeah it's, yeah, it's not but you, Dan, you, 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 Dan you do have Josh Bowler back at Blackpool he's someone that mm. you know is a very good player and also does like to score against QBR that must give you some hope <laughs> yeah a little bit I mean it would have been nice if we just kept him for the whole season because we might not be in, in the situation that we're in. That's how important he was last season. But, you know, when you get an offer as big as the ones, the one that Nottingham Forest, you know, paid for him uh, on the last day of the transfer window, it's and he's got a year left on his deal, it's just financial madness, really, to turn that down. So even though it's put us in a, help contribute to put us in the tricky spot that we're in now, I think they had to accept it. But it was a, I mean, I don't know how, if you know what happened with Bowler, but he went to obviously he went to Forest, then they loaned him out to Olympiacos, who the Forest owner also owns. Um, and he was got played a couple of games under Carlos Corberan, who's now at uh, West Brom. And then he got sacked, and the new manager came in and just didn't fancy Bowler at all, so he was just completely out of the squad. But because he'd already played for Blackpool, <laughs> he could uh, the only club he could go back to because he'd already played for two clubs in the year was was Blackpool, so. It was a choice of either staying in lovely Greece and, you know, having a nice time walking yeah. around Athens, where I went recently. It's very nice. Or going back to Blackpool and playing some football. And that's what Blackpool we went wins. for. So. Blackpool wins every yeah. time. <laughs> Blackpool like beat you, Athens. you, you <laughs> so can't beat the far. You can't beat the far coast in February and March, can you? <laughs> well, uh, uh, clearly that's what he felt. So, yeah. yeah. Now he's, uh, he's, I think he scored. I can't remember what Huddersfield, I think he scored against. So. And I, I went to the FA Cup game against Southampton and you could clearly see he wasn't at his best and he was still sort of playing catch up. But he had a couple of moments where he got on the ball and was doing what he was doing last year, taking people on and, and creating chances. So, yeah, it does give it a bit of hope. I mean, he's been in a bit in and out of the side as well um, since he came back, cause just because I don't, I don't think he's completely up to scratch because he didn't play any football really in Olympiacos. So, yeah, I mean, that's another slight glimmer of hope, but my hope is very quickly dwindling as the weeks go by unfortunately that's just the type of season it's been mm. Kevin do you think just as you say though Rangers were going to win eventually it had to happen um, but do you think that the fact that it was against someone like Watford who's got players like you know Ismail Assar and João Pedro you know really kind of high-end players that are probably too good for the championship 
do you think that gives I, any extra kudos to the win? I think, well, no, what, yeah, probably. But I was, I was very disappointed in Watford. They were poor on the day. I know we played. I think we just really, on Saturday, outworked them and really put it on them, got tight and put tackles in and put the ball in behind and chased it down. And yes, they've got Pedro and Saar. They are good players. They are probably favourite premiership players, but they didn't really get a kick on Saturday because of, of the way we played and put it right on top of them. So, very good win, considering that it is Watford. They have premiership players. They have just got relegated. So, yeah, that makes it a little bit more sweet. And, and let's be fair, they're sort of a local rival as well. They're not that far away. So, um, very good win. Also, I think um, it might sound a bit mad, but I think if you're QPR, Watford is kind of the team you want to play in this situation. I know they've, like you said, Ian, they've got very good players, but I mean, the amount of instability at that club, obviously Chris mm. Wilder's first game on the weekend, wasn't it? And I don't know, just something at, at Watford never seems quite right, you know, with the way it's being run and well, the amount of change of managers. I just feel like that that kind of plays into QPR, probably played into QPR's hands a bit and did them a favour, even though they've got very good players. It's, it's a weird club, isn't it? Well, you can't keep changing your manager. I mean, this is our third manager, isn't it? Already. Yeah, I mean, look how well Rob Edwards is doing at Luton as well. Isn't it? <laughs> There's more stability there at all, so yeah. it probably was the right time for QPR to play Watford on Saturday. Yeah, exactly. I mean, no one was expecting, you know, uh, expecting because of the run of form QPR have been on. No one was really expecting, but, you know, like I said, I thought the crowd were very good on Saturday. You know, it was like pretty much a packed house. And they got right behind the, right, right behind the team. And that does help, definitely help when you're sort of in the low confidence and haven't won games for a while. The crowd were really good on Saturday, really good. Yeah, I mean, I've still obviously been keeping on QPR from a distance and what's been going on. And like, it's just been nice and refreshing to see like on Twitter, like the videos of Ainsworth after the game, just someone who quite clearly really wants to be at QPR and really wants to be QPR manager. It's quite refreshing given, you know, what happened earlier in the season with Beal coming in and then he already had his eyes on the next thing. Um, so for Ainsworth to come in and you know be as happy as he was, obviously, you know, you could see how much that meant to him, and it seems you know genuine and authentic. I think that's massive. And I mean, I know hindsight's a wonderful thing. I, I was very surprised given how well Chris she did at Blackpool, just how wrong it went at QPR. I mean, I knew he was walking into a tough situation with the injuries and you know the team in bad form, but I didn't think it would go as badly as it went. But looking back now, you think maybe Ainsworth should have got the job after Beale left. That maybe that would have been the time to appoint and then maybe you might have got a few more wins on the board and you might not be quite where you are now but like I said that's all in hindsight and I think he was always going to get the job at some point wasn't he Ainsworth and I think the kind of circumstances aligned for him to to get it now so I mean you played for him with him didn't you Kev? Yeah. Yeah I mean what was it like I, I'm sure you discussed this before but I'm kind of interested to know like was he did he always like think he could be quite a good manager with the way he was in the changes he's been a character isn't he? It's just it, what Gareth has got lots of um, enthusiasm. And you know, when we was at the training ground, when he used to play, you, you could hear him come in every day, <laughs> you know, and you, you need you need characters like that at, at the tra in the training pitch and in the changing rooms. You need big characters and positivity and enthusiasm because it rubs off on everyone. And fair play, he's got his first win, deserved. The crowd were right behind him. And now we're going to play your mob, Blackpool, who you've absolutely said are rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> we can't lose, can we? So <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that. But now it's a tough game because Mick, I know Mick McCarthy and I played against his teams as well. And I know it ain't going great, but you did say your home form's okay. But they'll be thinking we need to, this is a, a must win game for Blackpool. And they'll be yeah. right. It will be a tough game. No, it will. It will. They're like, you know, we, we don't. We don't concede many goals at home. That's the thing, even though we don't create a lot. And that's kind of what you expect from a Mick McCarthy team, isn't it? To to dig in and, and make things difficult. And that, and we will do that. I'm sure we will. But, you know, unfortunately, I don't think we can nil-nil our way to championship safety. I think we're going to need a few wins for that to happen. So, you know, I think a draw might be a, a decent result for, for QPR, but not really for Blackpool. Yeah. Yeah, I like Mick McCarthy. He's, um, he's been around forever, hasn't he? But... Um... Very, very early in my journalism career, he was manager of the Republic of Ireland and I was working at the Irish Post and uh, used to be able to ring Mick at home. He used to have his home number. This is how long ago it was. You could <laughs> pick up the phone and dial the Ireland team manager at home and 
not quite that easy now, is it? He, he was he always claimed he never read the paper, and then he'd ring you up and moan about something he'd written in the paper. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but always always in a light-hearted way. So I like Mick, and you know it's good to see him. Yeah, we've Mick's a solid bloke back, back in football. Um, yeah, I mean a lot of the fans are like criticising him and like team selections. But it's like the situation he come into. I don't think it's it's really his fault to be honest. He's I mean the teams just the players just aren't very good. I don't think it's for want, lack of trying or lack of effort. I think lack of quality really more than anything and I suppose he's probably looked at it and think the best way to try and keep this team up is just to keep games as tight as possible and hopefully win a few chances that we get but you know it's just not panned, panned out that way so far but yeah I mean I've not had much obviously I'd seen you know Mick McCarthy when he was Wolves manager and things like that but I was covering the game we played at Southampton in the FA Cup and after the game he was so funny someone asked him about one of the Southampton guys asked him about you know, oh, he had a nice sort of moment. This was when Nathan Jones was still in charge. He had a nice moment with Nathan Jones outside. You know, he was very friendly. And I suppose you can sort of sympathise with him. You know, you're in a difficult situation, so is he. And he said, oh, yeah, but that's not because why I had a nice moment with him. He said, it's not because we're both in the shit. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's because I spent, I think they, I think he knew him from, from a while back when he was like an academy coach. And he said, uh, you know, I've spent my whole life fucking barking at him. It's not because we're both in the shit. <laughs> That's quite refreshing to be honest to hear a manager talk that like because you don't really get that anymore, do you? It's yeah, you know, very old school in in that sense. I think. Okay, Kev, what's the? I mean, you win. There's more than one way to skin a cat, as we always know in football. But was there a noticeable difference in the style on Saturday? Yeah, or I do you think it was, it was just a needs must kind of way to play? Or can we expect that for a long term to be more? I would I would say long term we will QPR will go a bit more direct. But I am I said this before. We, you know, we played um when I played for Undine Holloway, we we were very quite direct. I mean you had sometimes you had to play that way. I mean, no disrespect for Danny Shooter and Clark Carlisle, but they're not ball playing centre halves. So you're not gonna roll it out. You're gonna get the ball up up the up the pitch, which QPR did I thought a lot more a lot quicker and earlier on Saturday and it worked. Get the ball because one thing, Lyndon Dyke can challenge and can win a flick on. Chris Martin can challenge, get his uh, body in the way, hold it up and then you need runners off. You need runners off off them too and, and they chase things down and I think long term there will be a, a slightly change uh, in style and there'll be a QPR will go a little bit more direct. Because okay, you, think... you look at, I mean, one of the most direct teams in the championship are Luton. I mean, they just put the ball in constantly all the time. Nothing wrong with that. They're, were they third or fourth in the, they're in the playoffs? Millwall were very direct and they're in the top mm. six or seven. So there is different ways to skin a cat. But then you need certain players to play that way. And that doesn't really suit your Ilias Chair and your, your Chris Willock. So it's going to be interesting, like Dan said, about an interesting summer. What's going to happen with signings and maybe selling players and rebuilding, but I would say uh, there'll be a shift in the way QPR play a little bit more direct. I just think like you play the best way or the thing, the way that you think will most likely get results, don't you? That's, I mean, that's why I was, I, I wrote when Critchley got the job that I'd be very surprised if he tried to use the 4-4-2 system that he had at Blackpool. And then he, you know, I did it at QPR, which is really strange. I think Sam Field was playing out on the right, wasn't he? And now he's playing in the back three. It's like, Really a strange decision to to try and do that, and I think you know you you play um you just play you play to your strengths, don't you? I mean, I saw when Ainsworth, or just before he got the job, when it was kind of known that he was he was going to be confirmed as the new QPR manager. You know, I see a few tweets saying you know oh, I'm a bit concerned about the style, and but it's like with the situation you're in, do you know what I mean? Like who cares about the style? You just got to get results on the board, and I mean I I don't. It seems like the expectation now, Kevin. I don't know if you agree, and, and Ian is like you kind of expect it to come in and play passing out from the back football. That's kind of like what, I mean, especially at a club like QPR, I suppose they want to see that steamed as like good football. But I mean, for me personally, I actually don't mind seeing more direct football. I mean, Brentford, I think the kind of outside perception of them and the way they play is very different to the way they actually do. If you actually go and watch them, they're really direct long throws, oh. corners into the box to Ivan Tony and it, and it works like brilliantly. And I think, you know, if you've got Lyndon Dykes, like say, I suppose Chris Willick and Elias Chair, when they come back, it'll be interesting to see how that works because there's a bit of a, a different dynamic there. But I don't I, I don't mind watching the direct football either. I don't know what you think, guys, but, but I actually quite enjoy it. One thing, I, 
not a great fan of is watching the two centre halves pass it <laughs> to each other. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then the manager will say, "Look how good our possession stats are." <laughs> mm. You know, get the ball a little bit earlier. Never, never. If I mean, if you're a striker and there's no crosses coming in the box, you know, you're, you're having words with the wingers. Put the ball in the oh, box. Yeah. Oh, you don't cross it. So there will be, I will say, a, a shift in style in if, in the future, definitely. Yeah. Just to well, say, I'm I'm just, bring up, sorry, go on, Ian. I'm just um, for for me, yeah. You, you play a way to win games to keep you out of trouble, but I mean, I'm skeptical. I've got to be honest. Um, I still remember sitting there pulling my hair out when Ian Alloy was manager last time out. You know, seeing like the ball taken from kick off and launched out to the wing for Pavel show out to nod it, nod it down and then you'd lose possession you'd come back and you know <laughs> yeah the that's refusal, the other side of it that you don't want in it you know and then the refusal it should drive me absolutely berserk when you know the goalkeeper wouldn't roll the ball short out to, to full back to the ball from the back and just launch it long and it would come back it just for me it's not it's it, it's primitive football I, I hope we're not going back to that you know I've you know, yeah, I enjoyed you're... the football under Mark Warburton with SA and chair and that I mean yeah you win and it's, it, I appreciate this more than one way to skin a cat and, you know, we want to see good football. We, we don't be getting beat every week, but I I do hope it's just not going to be kind of caveman football we're going to be watching for, you know, the next sort of, you know, however long Gareth's in charge. That's my own opinion. And, um, but, you know, I hope there is a semblance of kind of some sort of progressive style of football because, you know, I enjoy seeing him in his chair and Chris Willard play. For me, they're proper footballers. That's what I want to go and see. I don't want to see... Mm. I don't want to watch Luton play every week. I don't want to watch Millwall play every week. Then you know, there's, there's, a, there's still you still got to play a stylish way at QPR. And I'm sorry, um, you know. So the jury's very much a, a football connoisseur. Yeah, when we're, we're, we're looking at Luton and Millwall and saying like we should be like them, that's no, 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 no. no. You can't be like that. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm not saying we should be like them. I said, but you, what you said, there's different ways to skin a cat, and QPR had to put it on top of Watford on Saturday because that was probably the the best way to, of beating them. Mm. We got to find out football and they might have that might result might not have worked. So you know you have to compete. And yeah. I know you know I watched the Rotherham game, it's like, come on lads. Mm. Run, compete, tackle, chase. Mm. All the basics of football and QPR did them basics very well on Saturday and won the game. Yeah, I, I I do agree, and I'm, I'm not saying that you know you should never hit a long pass, or it shouldn't be you know you 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 you, you play as Dan said to the strengths of your side and what you think will win you the game. But you know there has been a sort of style of play at QPR that I've enjoyed watching the last sort of three mm. three and a half years um, that was very different to what we saw previously. Um, so I, I hope we keep some of that, but also a bit more pragmatism as well, because I mean ultimately you want to win football matches. So it doesn't really matter how you do it, but at the same time, I still think there's a, you know, there should be a certain way of playing. Yeah, I'll jump but I mean, you, if you go the other way, and you look at if I bring it back to Blackpool, I mean, under Michael Appleton, under Critchley, we were very functional and and direct, and we got the ball up to Gary Medine, and because that that you know we we come up from League One, you know, we're a small club, one of the smallest budgets in the league, and that's the best way to play to get results, and it worked. I mean, under Appleton. You've got Chris Maxwell rolling the ball out to Kenny Dougal on the edge of the box, or his own box from a goal kick, and he's giving it away. And I'm just like, they're going to give me a heart attack if they keep doing this. It was just absolute madness. It was like, you know, Kenny Dougal, ball-winning midfielder, you know, solid defensive player. He's he's bet, you know, his, his strengths are winning the ball back and, and laying it off to the more creative players, and you're giving it to him on the edge of his own box to try and play it out. It's yeah. like, what are we doing? It's like. That I mean, that's madness when when managers come in and they try and implement a style that they that they think is, you know, the way football should be played and the way you can get results. But you need the players to do it. Do you know what I mean? And and like I suppose I just looked at the QPR team on paper. On paper, there, if you said that was the QPR team that was going to be playing at this stage of the season, I mean, if, if I showed you that at the start of the year, you'd be pretty worried. Yeah. I think Chris Martin, young Aaron Drew, who's done pretty well by all accounts, I gather. You know, Kakai playing at what is he on the left, Kev on. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you'd be pretty worried, wouldn't you, if that was the team? But obviously, Ainsworth has gone back to a style which he thinks can get the well, best result. But well, I think good. when Willick and Chair come back, it'll be interesting to see what happens because you do need to get them on the ball. And I agree, and get them playing because 
that's the way you win games, I think, with QPR at the moment. I think, I think considering the run that QPR are on, they had to go a little bit more direct. Yeah. And not play risk football, like you say, rolling it out and then getting caught in your own box and stuff. Not that QPR are doing it, but what will happen? You've got to do a bit of both. You've got to roll it out. Sometimes it's got to go long. Sometimes the ball's got to go in the box. Yeah, because you don't want to be predictable, do you? So you've got to do a bit of both. But I um, needs must, and we, we, QPR were desperate for three points and got them playing that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, I mean, just, just on the, the flip side of what, what I said before, I mean, it is refreshing to see, you, you know, players putting it in and wanting it more because sometimes Rangers can be a bit passive and a bit kind of, you know, bypassed a little bit. But, you know, it, I, I guess if we're going to be frank about it, inferior squads, teams like Luton and Millwall who haven't got better players than QPR. But there's often, you know, a feeling that they've got more desire and they more want to win more than to particularly the game at Kenilworth Road, Rangers were bullied in that game. So, mm. um, I mean, I do agree with you say like Brentford and, and, and Fulham as well, to a degree, also. Yeah, get out of the mix a bit, a bit more physical, but, but, you know, you're mixing it up the way forward, but I think if it's just going to be, you know, a, a pragmatic and a style for all matches, then that, that would leave me slightly concerned long-term. You're not leading the West London podcast as well, Ian, are you? <laughs> He left. And a Mick Beale as well. But, um... It's all gone downhill since I left. <laughs> <laughs> well, it started going downhill a bit before I left. No, then it went really downhill. So, it might so we've got me hosted now, so it's definitely gone downhill. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, okay, gentlemen. Well, so um, prediction for tomorrow first to you, Kevin. How do you see this one going? Well, I would, at the start of this programme, I said I would take a draw, but now listening to Dan saying how bad the Blackpool are, I'm still going to go for a draw. I'm going to go 1-1, and that would be a really good point. Keeps uh, Blackpool below us and, you know, keeps the run going of not losing in two games where we couldn't win one in 20. Well, only one in 20. So I'm going to go 1-1. I think that would be a good point. Wow, I can't believe Ken thinks we're going to score. <laughs> Kev thinks we're going to score a goal, so he's more optimistic than 90% of Blackpool fans out there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards a QPR win. To be honest, I mean our home form's all right. I think it's either going to be nil nil or one nil to QPR. But I'll go one nil to QPR. I think. I mean, I just I, my my optimism for this season has just completely gone out the window. I mean, when Mick came in and I was, you know, it sort of lifts a bit, and then we get a couple of good result, decent results, and then sort of hopes go up again. And then I mean, we lost three one at Reading, and that terrible game that was. Um, losing 2 0 at Bristol City on the weekend and barely creating a chance. It's just, I just, unfortunately, I know, <laughs> you know, I talk about how bad Blackpool are, but I just at the point of the season, and, you know, you've been, I'm sure you've been there as QPR fans before when you just get to the point where things are so bad, you just, all your hope goes out the window. So that was last week, Dan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. But yeah. I mean, you think it's bad at QPR. At least you had those two, three months under Beal where you thought, oh my God, we're going to win the league. We're going to get promoted in the Premier League. We we haven't had, we've not had that all season. So I got sucked into that last season when I thought, oh, yeah. getting in the playoffs and then yeah. collapsed. And then four goalkeepers all yeah. got muscle injuries, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kicking the ball. So yeah, no, I think one nil QPR. I think I do think, and that will be mass. I think if you beat us tomorrow, I think you know you're safe. I mean, obviously, if if you beat that point, you don't get another point. You might be in trouble, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think if you beat us and then. Yeah, the I think I think you've pretty much confirmed your safety there. So uh, and then it, it looks towards the the long term and the future. So yeah, that is my prediction. Mm. I am a little bit concerned about this one. I think um, backing up so quickly after a, a game where players are out on their feet, the squad is still um, there's a lot of players still not available for tomorrow. Um, Blackpool haven't won up since uh, once since October, I believe. I've seen this film far too many times. Um, um, sorry, I mean negative. I think I think Blackpool might nick this. I think. Um, oh my yeah. god! I mean, Jesus. The last I think, half of that. Yeah. I think well, Blackpool, you, might, you, Blackpool, you would not be saying that. Trust me. Um, <laughs> I think Blackpool are going to win this uh, one nil. Um, oh my god! 
Yeah. I went for a Watford. Def- I went for a Watford win last week in QPR one. So I'm doing the old um, <laughs> yeah. psychology here. But wow. um, I think it'd be, if I can get a win up here, it'd be a really big. I think this 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 almost would be a bigger win for QPR than beating Watford Saturday. The back up from that, and like, I'm just not hundred percent that with the players out and the players that are playing that put a big shift in on Saturday, backing up so soon with Dykes. You know, he's not at the full speed. I don't know. We'll see. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm I, not, I'm not right here. Really talking about this one. This yeah, I hope you're right. There we go. <laughs> anyway, gents, yeah, thank you very much as ever. Thanks, Dan, for taking time out to do this for us. Much appreciated. Yeah, I hope I cheered all the QPR fans up by talking about how bad Blackpool are. You know, well, I've made them miserable. Always, so. <laughs> yeah, I always think it could be worse. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Bye now.